Hello everyone, I'm Chase Jarvis. Welcome to another episode of Chase Jarvis Live here on Creative Live. You're tuned into the 30 Days of Genius series. That's where I sit down with the world's top creatives, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders and extract valuable insights that you can apply to your day-to-day to help you live your dreams in career, hobby, and in life. If you're new to the series, you're just hearing about it for the first time, go to creativelive.com slash 30 days with genius, the number three zero days of genius. All you gotta do is press that blue button and then you'll get one of these badass interviews in your inbox every day for 30 days. It's 100% free. My guest today is the most recognizable, maybe the most famous entrepreneur in the history of the world. He has disrupted so many industries. He's disrupted the airline industry, the music industry, the train industry. Now he's turned his sights to space travel, uh, among other things, he just dropped his first film here at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York last night. My guest is the one and only Sir Richard Branson. I see you. Thank <laughs> you, sir. They love you. So, over the course of this conversation, my goal is to inspire the people on the other side of the camera with not just your life story, but, but actionable insights. And I read some press about the, the film dropping last night, and one of the things that was so impressive to me was the decision to go, to actually do something instead of nothing. Um, and I think there's some connections, clear connections, between your entrepreneurship and flying a balloon across the Atlantic when you had experience, but little experience, and, and there was a willingness to sort of just go. Can you talk to me about that sort of that, it seems like an innate part of you, but probably it was learned, I don't know, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. <laughs> um, well, I've always uh, had the philosophy that, you know, screw it, uh, just do it, is a lot more fun than, um, than not screwing it and not doing it. <laughs> um, and, um, and sometimes it's got me into a lot of trouble, uh, and sometimes, uh, more, more often than not, it's been, it's been fantastic. And um, so, you know, I suppose one of my greatest fear in life is saying no to something and then regretting it. So, um, so I have said yes a lot. And, um, and in the case of, um, you know, the ballooning adventures, um, yeah, nearly cost us my life, but it, it, it helped put Virgin on the map on a global basis and, um, and you know, helped, helped get the brand established. And, um, and it was actually great fun when it, when it was going well and it was actually terrifying when it wasn't. Um, it sounds um, like so many things in life, that yeah. entrepreneurship and actually being in a balloon. For the, a little bit of context, can you, it was the first uh, it, it balloon. Was the, it was the first um, time that uh, well, we, five people had actually tried to cross the Atlantic. Five people had died. So it was it was the um, it was the an at- attempt to try to do it differently than the others had done it, and that was to fly in the jet stream at thirty five thousand feet, where you've got very strong winds, uh, to be above the bad weather. Um, and um, uh, and you know we were the first, and then and then foolishly we decided to do the Pacific, um, <laughs> and a lot a lot of exciting things went wrong on the way, but um, we missed Los Angeles, I think, by two and a half thousand miles, which is what we were aiming for, and ended up in the Arctic, but, um, but they, were, they were great adventures. And there's a lot of parallels uh, between the risks there uh, and, and entrepreneurship, clearly. Maybe not risking your life, per se. Was the, was the decision to, to take on that risk, was it for your business or if it was for yourself to give you sort of personal energy? A lot of people like, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you've already mentioned in this interview twice, fun, how important that is for me, for you. So uh, how do those things sort of relate to one another in your mind? Are they connected? Was the adventure connected (laughs) to entrepreneurship? Yeah, so um, we had um, uh, a successful record company, but we had a one airline, 747 for, for Virgin Atlantic, and we were just trying to think of unique ways of putting this tiny little airline on, on the map. Um, and you know, this balloonist said that he, he thought he could build a balloon to do the job. And so initially it was, you know, it was something we embarked on to see if we could get Virgin on the map. Uh, it obviously then became much more important than that and, and, and a, great, a great personal adventure. I think the, I think the parallels one can um, draw from in, in business is that um, the most important thing when you start a business is thinking about protecting the downside. You know, what, you know, how can you avoid 
the business going bust? Um, you know, um, you know what, can, what will you do? If it does go bust, are you going to lose your home or, or not lose your home? Um, uh, in, as an adventurer, you know, obviously the downside is losing your life and, and you've got to uh, do everything you can to avoid that. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then if you do lose your life, at least you've, um, you, know, you, you know you've avoided, you've done everything you could or can not to have done. For sure. Uh, and of course, you'll kick yourself. My, my uh, I have a strong recollection. You're an investor in Creative Live, and, and one of the first times we met in San Francisco, um, you gave me that same advice. I said, you know, if you're going to give a guy like me a piece of advice, you know, in the startup world, we're trying to build a game-changing, paradigm-changing company for education. What would it be? And, and you told me to take great chances, and yet predict or protect the downside. Is that a sort of a mantra across all of your businesses, or how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've, it, it, it is a mantra. I haven't always abided by it. I mean, <laughs> Don't I'm, take your own you know, advice. Okay, occasionally in the early days, I would ask my wife to sign a bit of paper uh, without her knowing that that was the house on the line for about the 10th time. Um, and we could have ended up on the street. So, um, you know, so, uh, but, but obviously that was a foolish thing to do and, and I wouldn't recommend it to other people. And, um, and I think, um, you know, um, to be able to sleep well at night and know you've got a roof over the head is important. So, um, you know, so take take bold bold steps and bold risks, but don't necessarily put everything on the line. So you have something like 400 companies under the Virgin umbrella now. It started from your kitchen counter, didn't it? Was it I mean, it was- It started was from a phone box uh, at my school when I was 15. Um, we didn't have mobile phones and um, and I wanted to start a magazine to campaign against the Vietnamese War, and um, and you know, so I had to try to sell advertising um, for the magazine in order to get it going. And so I literally, were, you know, it, it, when people weren't, when there wasn't a queue outside the school phone box, I went in there and rang up Coca Cola and rang up Pepsi, and you know, say, well, Pepsi's agreed to take an ad, and then Coke would jump in, and then I'd rang up. Ring up, ring up. Coke There's some lessons in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, so we, we, we kept, um, you know, and then, then we tried the same with banks. You know, NatWest is there, they're taking an ad. And anyway, so I learned, I learned the art of bullshit quite early on when it came to selling advertising. And that was uh, at your school, as you mentioned. Um, how, let's talk about what role school played for you. Obviously, uh, I've gone to Virgin Disrupt with you and spoken there. Um, about the future of education, how it's changing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your sort of, I, I've read and we've spoken a little bit about it, a little bit of a disconnect between you and traditional education. Um, what do you think about education today? Where is it going and how to, what's the best way for the people at home who are listening to sort of prepare for their future? Um, I'm, I'm dyslexic um, and, uh, and therefore uh, formal education didn't interest me, and therefore I wasn't any good at it. Um, once something interests me, then then um, you know then I then I lap it up and learn quite quickly, um, and um, and uh, and I think education generally just should be a lot more interesting, a lot more relevant, um, and um, you know, for instance, you know, like if you showed people. A ballooning film across the Atlantic. They would learn, you know, they could learn a whole masses of lessons from it. You know, like hot air rises. Um, you know, there, there's a jet stream, you know, tra traveling at 200 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. There's, you know, and so on and so on. I mean, there's just there's just so much you can, uh, you you can, so, you know, so many techniques you can use to bring education alive. And um, but instead, um, you know, people, for instance, in Britain are taught French. Nobody ever learns French. It's a completely useless language. And, um, you know, Spanish would be much more useful. And, and people are still taught Latin, um, you know, <laughs> algebra. I mean, all, you know, I mean, all, all these bizarre subjects, where, whereas um, it's not that relevant to life. How, uh, and as people, uh, it sounds like you're encouraging people to lean into their passions. Uh, is it with... Is it because you have greater energy around things that you care about? Um, is it because that's where your aptitudes lie? What's your philosophy on? I think I, I, th I think you know it's sort of foolish to spend your life not for, not not becoming expert at your passions. If you're passionate about something, you're going to give it um, you're going to give it your all, and 
um, and you're going to en en enjoy learning about it. Whereas if you have no interest in it, um, uh, you're, you're not going to uh, you're not going to lap it up. Well, would you category? I mean, now with 400 companies under the Virgin Group, I th is it fair to say you have 400 interests? Or I know those are. Uh, I understand the structure of Virgin. I'm, in, I'm I'm interested in in life generally, and um, and. I love learning about new things, and if something frustrates me, I'll I'll dive in there and um, and try to improve it. Um, and um, and quite a lot of things must have frustrated me <laughs> in my life. <laughs> well, I think that's uh, I've often uh, in the little experience I have relative to you, um, but I've always found that scratching my own itch, if there's a problem that I have personally or some people that are close to me, that the, the vigor that I will sort of go into a challenge like that is always much greater. And I, th I, th I believe you started Virgin Atlantic because you, you missed a flight or you had a bad flight experience. Can you recall that for us? Like that's yeah, literally like, scratching yeah. your own itch. I, right? I was trying to get from um, Puerto Rico to the British Virgin Islands and American Airlines only had a half full flight. And so they told us all to come back the next morning. Um, I had a beautiful lady waiting for me in the BBI. I was not going to wait till the next morning. Um, and so I, I went to the back of the airport. I was 28 years old. Um, I hired a plane, um, borrowed a blackboard, and then just wrote as a joke, Virgin Airlines, $39 one way to, the, uh, to Puerto Rico. And I went and all the people who'd been bumped and, and filled up my first plane. Um, and then the next day, I rang up Boeing and said, do you have any secondhand 747s for sale? <laughs> and you went from a plane that's <laughs> island hopping to a 747? <laughs> they, uh, and uh, anyway, so we, so we were, so, you know, so that was, yeah, I mean, that was literally out of frustration. I was, gonna, I was getting to that lady. <laughs> um, but also just the frustration of air, you know, the way that airlines did sort of treat you. Uh, the, the and by the way, I think, yeah. you know, the, the best businesses come from um, people's bad personal experiences. I mean, it, you know, like people who are listening to this program, I mean, you know, if you just keep your eyes open, you're going to find, you're, you're going to uh, find something that frustrates you. And then, and then you think, well, you know, I, I, I can maybe do it better than, than, um, than it's being done. And there you have a business. I mean, if you can improve people's lives, you have a business. Um, uh, you know, I'm a proud investor in, in your company. And, um, you know, I, I love what you do, and, and, I, and I think, um, you know, you're, you're fulfilling a, you know, a real service to, you know, to people out there, and, um, and therefore, you know, that the business is going to be successful, and, um, and there is still, you know, people think, well, everything's been thought of, but uh, actually, you know, all the time, that's the great thing about capitalism, there's, there's uh, gaps in the market here, gaps in the market there, ways of improving things here, ways of improving things there. Um, and um, and people should just give it, you know give it a go. Do you do you feel like the um, there's a, there's a certain sense of play with you personally with your brand um, and it's to a certain extent in, in solving problems. For example, the story you told about walking around with a blackboard and tickets to the BVI for thirty nine dollars. How important is play to you personally and then to sort of the entrepreneurial spirit? I think play is really important. I mean, I, I, I think we only live once, and we, we ought to try to live with a smile as best we can, and, and have a have a good time. And um, and you know, one of my favourite days in the year is April Fool's Day, and uh, love love uh, <laughs> I love you know, what you guys love, did love, this love, year. Love, love love pulling people's legs, and um, and you know, sometimes it backfires. I, mean, I once ended up in prison all day for it on April Fool's Day when. Uh, they managed to turn it, turn it on me. Sometimes it's successful, like you know, with our glass bottom planes of last year, where you know, I mean, I think that it went viral. The whole world thought that Virgin Atlantic was building glass bottom planes, and um, people love the idea. So I suspect we will one day. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, let's talk about space. Um, I feel space, uh, obviously, the next frontier. But it also sounds so undoable when you're standing here on Earth and you're looking out there, uh, yet you're running headlong into it. Is there, you know, do you have the same sort of fears of starting any business? Is this, is it de-risked because there's so many players in the game now? Or I, I, how do you, how do you think about space? Um, it's incredible that you're going after it. It's uh, enormously challenging. Um, it is rocket science, and it is tough. Um, uh, 
and we've been going now um, for 10 years. Um, so it's been, you know, it's cost us a penny or two as well, or a dollar or two. Um, they, um, uh, it's, um, you know, resulted in tears, um, but we think that um, we're almost there. Um, the space, new spaceship is finished. It's starting its test program, um, and we, we just hope to be up and away in, in the not too distant future. Um, and so it's not, you know, putting people just into space, I, I think it's very important because I think, um, you know, that overview effect of looking back on Earth um, transforms people, and we'd, we'd love to have many people become astronauts and experience that. Um, but equally, you know, we'll be putting. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, satellites into space, which will um, connect people. I mean, like there are four billion people who can't get your programming um, in the world um, uh, because they don't have internet or Wi-Fi access. Um, if we can actually help connect those four billion people, then, then um, education, health, um, you know, um, people being able to start businesses, a whole mass of things follow from it. So lots of exciting things from space travel. And was that inspired, was it a, like a childhood vision that you had? Was it inspired from the view that you got, you know, from those balloons at 30,000 feet? It was, um, it was inspired out of frustration again. I mean, I, I couldn't understand. I wanted to go to space. Um, but NASA, uh, the Chinese, Russians, they just weren't interested in you or me going to space. So in the end, I thought, screw it, let's do it. Uh, I'll, reg I'll reg register the name Virgin Galactic Airways, which I did. That was the first thing I did. And then I'll travel around the world trying to find engineers. With your chalkboard? Uh, yeah, well, engineers to, um, you know, who could knock a, knock a spaceship together and build rockets, and, and the rest hopefully will be history. Oh, um, well, that's very inspiring. And I think there's so many folks I, we mentioned before the camera started rolling, talked about there's sort of two groups behind the cameras here. There's a group that is you know, stuck in something they don't want to be in and taking that first step seems like something, some gigantic um, risk for them or for their family. And there's the other group of folks that have started something and are looking to take it to the next level. So that's two questions here, one for each group. The first group, um, advice that you would give to the folks who are trying to go from zero to one there. They may be, you know, bound by fear or, or yeah. what's keeping them down. I think, um it's particularly, di particularly difficult to take a risk and start your own business. Uh, if you've got a comfortable job, um, you know, you're, you're paying off a mortgage, you've got maybe children, um, you've got a partner, um, uh, and, you know, to, to, you know and, and, and I completely understand why people, um, you know, are fearful of then going out and trying to start a business. Um, Having said that, I think that you know if you if you feel that you've got a great idea and and um, and you, you you've got you know something really special, if you can um, you know find other people who also believe in your idea. Um, obviously, if it's finance as well, you know so much the better. Yeah. Um, and then if you can surround yourself with great people, you know I think you'll get an enormous satisfaction from trying it. Um, uh, you know, but obviously, I fully understand that. You know, if you if 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 you if you're having to look after kids at home and education, um, it, you know, you you have to you have to be, you know, brave, veering on foolish. You know, to 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 give it a go. But um, but it's um, you know, but the upside of pulling it off is pretty pretty damn good. So. Yeah, the, it's all about the you know. If you're talking about protecting the downside, then the sort of the reward. Um, part of what I understand is a struggle for folks that are in that camp is sort of the fear of failure, yeah. um, obviously. But I think for the folks at home to hear some of your struggles would help them because I think they look at you as sort of um, unflappable and you've had all this success. But you know, yeah, well, we've come, we've come, you know. I mean, there's a very thin dividing line between success and failure, and you know, we've come very close on a number of occasions to crossing the, the, that dividing line, even to the extent on a Friday night having the bank manager at my home telling me that uh, on the Monday morning he was going to put the whole of the Virgin Group out of, out, out of business. Um, um, and I told him he wasn't welcome in the house. I pushed him out of the house, which is you know, quite a risk, risky thing to do with your bank manager. Um, and I, I sat down just shaking with 
anger. Um, and then we spent the weekend, you know, um, making calls and managed to rustle enough money up to sort him out on the on the Monday. But um, but um, uh, so uh, uh, if we had if we'd failed, I mean, we were lucky enough not to. If we had failed, I think I think I'm the kind of person would have picked my, picked myself up, brushed myself down, learnt learnt from everything I'd achieved, and started again. And I, and I, and I, you know, a lot of very successful entrepreneurs have had failures and have brushed themselves down and started again, um, and learn, learn from, you know, learn from, uh, their, learn from their struggles. So, one of the things that, uh, you know, aside from the entrepreneurship adventures, and we've talked about everything from space to school newspapers or school magazines, um, let's talk about you personally for a second, because I think that the psychology is sort of apparent when you talk about all of the, the, the way you think and how you look at risk, all that stuff. But what about you personally? Is there, are there some things that have kept you especially grounded, whether it was community or family? Um, are there some things that you do every day that if you sort of don't mm-hmm. have that, you, you feel remiss? Talk, if you can get a little bit personal, like what is Yeah, what I mean, I, I, mean I think you know, the best decision I made in my life was um, Finding a very down-to-earth Glaswegian um, uh, beautiful lass about 40 years ago, um, falling in love, and um, and you know she's been as you know been my rock over those years, and um, been a wonderful mother, and and um, uh, and you know from there I've been able to have the freedom to you know get get out and create things and. Um, I've always worked from home, um, so you know she's had to put up with put up <laughs> with quite a lot. Um, uh, I think working from home means that um, that I've had to learn to delegate, and I've found very good people who, um, to delegate to. Um, uh, and is working from home something that is it, does it feel like more comfortable for you, or what is what is? I the just love I love uh, you know I love the fact that the children. You know, would you know, were literally at my feet. Oh, I've yeah. seen pictures of you on the phone with <laughs> yeah. paper spread all over the kitchen they, table. They, yeah, and so so it's been it's been great to be able to. Sp- I think I spent more time with my children than most people I know, um, and we're, therefore you know we are a very very close family. Um, also working, and I work. My home is an island, so uh, that's a wonderful place. It's to, actually right behind us um, on the wall there. <laughs> a wonderful place to um, sit and and you know think about the bigger the bigger picture. Um, the other advantage of working in, from home is, uh, you know, I, and especially living on an island, is uh, keeping fit is very important. Um, and, you know, every morning I get up and I play tennis, I make sure it's singles so with, and play with somebody better than me, a pro, um, do the same in the evening. Um, and we have, you know, um, real battles. Um, if the wind's up, I'll kite surf in the day as well. Um, and then, you know, between all that, you know, work hard. So, you know, but because I'm keeping healthy and fit, I, I, I actually get, I think, more hours work in a day than most people. And then how about, uh, is there any, how, how do you get your information? Do you try and sort of reduce the volume of information so you can sort of be in a, in a quiet place or are you looking for as many inputs as possible? Clearly, if you live on an island, there's a, a bit of you that um, wants to remain very private, but how important is sort of information and connection to um, information the outside world? and connection is really important. And and you know I'm a I'm a good listener. I mean I think a good leader needs to be a good listener. Um, I mean I know what I think, so I don't need to listen to my own voice. And and um, and I'm learning all the time from listening, from taking notes. Um, you know if I'm having a conversation with somebody, I'll, I'll always have a notebook in my lap. Um, uh, you know, making the list of things that I need to get done, um, and you know, I sometimes just can't understand people. You know, you'll you'll have a, a business meeting, nobody takes notes. You know that nothing's going to get done. I mean, maybe somebody might remember one thing, two maximum, but um, you know, if, you, if if there's a list of sort of fifteen or twenty decisions that need to be made from it, um, then um, a cr- critical to, critical, I think, to make make a note and get these things done. Um, and I think that often differentiates a good leader from a bad leader. I mean, some leaders think it's beneath me to be taking notes. You know, that's, that's something a secretary should be doing. But you know, just you know, forget that. Write these things down. There's something that's very, um, very uh, 
present with you, with the companies you've started, with the people that I know that work for you. Um, there's a sense of sort of, of creativity. Um, and you know, that's my personal mission in life is to make the, the world a more creative place, creative lives mission. Uh, can you talk to me about your view of creativity? Do you think about it in a, in a painting, photography, drawing, design way? Do you think about creativity with a capital C and how important is that in establishing your businesses and in your personal life? Like what role does, does creativity play for you? Do you know, it sounds a strange thing to say, but I think um, the diff the, the, there is not a lot of difference between a, a business person and, and an artist. Um, an artist has a blank, a blank sheet of paper and they've got to you know, paint, that, paint the paper. And if it's going to be a good painting, every single little detail on, on that um, canvas uh, will be beautiful. Um, if you're, you know, I mean, like 10 years ago, um, we decided, you know, let's set up um, an airline that people actually will want to fly in America. Um, they didn't have good airlines then. Um, and so we set up Virgin America, a blank, blank sheet of canvas, and we had to get every single thing right, all the little details right um, in, in setting up that business. We had to be very creative. And, um, and because every single little detail was got right, it, we, we created um, an exceptional airline. Amazing experience. Um, and and um, and uh, and and you know the rest is history. And and um, uh, so uh, detail details detail is you know it, it's all that little detail that make make up you know for the perfect picture at the end of the day. Yeah, there's a quote from the designers Ames, uh, Eames brothers: "The details aren't the details; the details are the thing." Um, and I have also been on record saying that in the future, all CEOs will be considered artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there are people who are, are specifically not inclined to that, they, they can they have roles in the company, but the sort of the vision is a creative experience. And I love the connection that you just made between the details in a, in a piece of art and the details in building a business. Uh, since you mentioned Virgin America, I'm gonna go there for a second. One of the, the ways that Virgin America got on the map for me was a the virgin brand of course like so welcomed in the u.s in a world i've flown millions of air miles hundreds of thousands every year so it was a, it was a welcome uh different experience than what we've got here um, but specifically as soon as you sit down on the plane the lights different the seats different the staff is different even in you know the site was so much different in, in buying your first ticket and yet, when you sit down, the safety video comes on. This is years ago in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where no one thought innovation was possible. The TSA is literally the most, the most <laughs> impressive organization in probably the, in, the US, uh, in the US government. And yet you found a way to sort of usurp that paradigm and make a beautiful, playful video mm -hmm. that delighted folks in an area where no one thought innovation was possible. Mm. I use that as an example all the time with my company mm. and with my peers. How important is sort of finding an area that hasn't yet been sort of exploited is the wrong word, but sort of viewed from that different angle that only you or some, mm. some other entrepreneur, like can you, can you go right in the front door and try and compete with um, some of the, you know, the, the American airlines that you cited earlier, or, or is your philosophy about sort of entering from the side door or the back door and exploiting the cracks? Like, how do you think about things? Yeah, I think if something is run in a very stuffy way, and safety videos were run in a stuffy way <laughs> The stuffiest, for, forever, the worst. Um, uh, then, you know, one shouldn't be frightened of um, unstuffifying it. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good one. Um, they, um, uh, and... Uh, and, and, and a lot of you know, big airlines would, would be frightened. They'd worry that the Civil Aviation Authority is going to come down on them for taking, not treating safety with a, with a proper decorum. Um, but of course, the, the fact of life is that if you actually make a safety video enjoyable to watch, um, people are going to watch it and they're going to get the messages. And, um, uh, and, and if there was an incident, they're, they're more likely to remember the messages. If, if, you, if you have a safety video that's the boring same thing every time, nobody watches it. So, um, Can we I mean, say, that, is it fair to say that that's creativity at work? Yeah, I know, of course it's creativity at work. And, and um, um, I mean, 
I was just thinking there was this, um, some years ago at Virgin Atlantic, I, the, the chief accountant rang me up and said, um, everyone's stealing our salt and pepper pots. We're going to have to put something more boring on the plane because you know, they, they just love them. It's uh, uh, little windmills and, and, um, uh, and you know, it's costing us X, X amount of dollars a year. And, um, and I thought about it and I rang him back a couple of hours later and saying, no, no, you keep them on, but I was going to do something. So underneath all the salt and paper pots, we then printed a uh, pinch from Virgin Atlantic <laughs> and um, they became the greatest promotion as people were, were having their dinner parties. Uh, somebody was saying how impressed they were, their salt and pepper pots, and then they turned off and went, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's certainly l leaning into uh, an opportunity. Um, go back to your personal life, if we can, just for a second. Is there anything, you, you talked about um, sort of uh, space being in your own island, and I think for the folks at home, you don't have to have an island. You could, you know, yeah, just well, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, I used to live on a houseboat, so and um, Virgin started from literally, you know, the, my, my children lived on a houseboat. It was, had two rooms. Uh, you know, my wife was there, and I was running, you know, building the Virgin Company on a houseboat, and um, and you know, it was a, it, it was a place that people liked to come and visit because it was a houseboat. You know, but it was a beaten up old houseboat. Um, and it had the smallest kitchen and the smallest loo in, 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 in any, anywhere in London. Um, so, um, but, you know, we were as happy on that houseboat as, as I suspect we are today on, on an island. I mean, you know, so, so um, you know, so um, try, to, you know, if you can, try to find a place to work that's got a pleasant environment. That's not always affordable, but if you can, that, 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 that yeah, I think that helps. Um, and... Um, uh, I mean, I love, for instance, the, you know, the, 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 these organizations that are, um, you know, sharing office space um, and uh, where you can feed off, feed off other people when you're starting a business. I think, you know, I mean, that's a, a gr you know, great way for people to go and, you know, find a bit of space and then, they, they, and then you can learn from each other and help each other. How, how important is that energy? The energy uh, of oh, I think, it's, I think it is important. I mean, the... the uh, you know, when I started, um, you know, when I left school, um, you know, having just, you know, a group of people together um, feeding off each other was, was, was essential and um, uh, learn, learning from each other, helping each other through the bad times, enjoying the good times together. So you talked about your space, whether it's a houseboat or an island. You talked about physical fitness and health. I think there's a sad story, at least in the U.S., I, I believe globally, that creativity sort of needs to pull everything out of you. And we have so many sad stories of the Kurt Cobains, the Janis Joplins sort of taking their own lives. But I think it's going to bear out that sort of having a long creative arc to your life is uh, so much more valuable, not just to you, but to the world and contribution-wise. Um, anything else, if, if you talked about your space, you talked about you know health and wellness, uh, how important is... Um, you know, what do you do to, to, for inspiration, for example? I think the world who doesn't think of themselves as hyper-creative is out there like, oh my gosh, where does Sir Richard get his ideas? And how does my, you know, even the uh, startups and, and even the corner store, like where do they get their ideas and inspiration? So where does someone I think, like you? I mean, I think, if, you know, it, it, to, 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 traveling, you know, traveling a lot, I think is important. I mean, like, you know, some people listening to this, they may be out of a job. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, go to somewhere like Bali, you know, which costs almost nothing when you get there. I mean, fact, you know, I mean, you know, um, you know, just get out there, travel, keep your eyes open, um, uh, and you know, I suspect in that in that three months, six months process, you'll come up with some, you know, some some exciting ideas. Um, but you've got to be open open to ideas and out, out there out there listening. Um, I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of not many people actually. You know, make an effort and try to find out, you know, what's going on in Germany, what's going on in France, what's going on in Britain, what's going on in America, what's going on in Canada. Who who's come up with bre you know, new breakthrough ideas recently? I mean, for instance, you know, we've invested in a company called Doctors on Demand, which, you know, so you know, you you ring them up and um, and there's a doctor and they'll give you 15 minutes at any time of the day from anywhere in the world. Um, great idea, you know, and and you know uh, and. Um, you know, mainly American-based, but you know, if somebody in Europe heard that idea, you know, they, they should get in and compete. You know, I mean, it's it, it, and 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 um, 
So, um, you know, so if you, can't, sort of if, you, if you can't come up with your own unique ideas, um, there's other people who will have already come up with ideas in some country or other, which you can, um, you know, if, if they manage to make it work in Holland, you know, you, it's quite likely you'll be able to make it work in whichever country you live in. And if, if travel is inspiration, uh, and that's very external to you, is there anything, any internal sort of sense of inspiration that you get? Like, um, you know, you cite your, your mum or your childhood or, um, you know, I'd like to come back to your dyslexia. Well, my mother, my mother um, uh, you know, always taught us to, you know, like we weren't allowed to watch television. We had to be out there doing things, creating things. Um, um, and, uh, you know, she would, you know, like push me out of the car age six, told me to make my own way to granny's house and, um, or, you know, sent me on a bike ride in the pouring rain, you know, 400 miles, <laughs> um, as, as you do when you're, you're a 10 year old. Um, and, and, you know, so she was trying to bring us up tough. You're taking a slight risk, you know, like if, if we'd had an accident, you know, she obviously would have regretted it, but, um, but we didn't, we survived. And, and, and I think we came, came out the stronger for it at the far end. Uh, and then to go back to your uh, life with dyslexia, how important has that been in shaping you and, and how have you sort of taken what was once considered maybe uh, a challenge and, and made it, clearly made it something that works well for you? I think, I think the most important thing about my dyslexia was uh, that, that it helped me uh, learn the importance of delegation. And, and uh, you know, if you're gonna build a business, don't try to do it all yourself. Find, find people who are better than yourself um, to, um, to do, you know, run things on a day-to-day -day basis, and um, and that then leaves you up to to think about the big the bigger picture. Um, so, um, uh, so I think dyslexia, uh, um, you know, it is strange. I'm, I mean, I sometimes think back to the, my days at school where I would look at. There's it, no name. There's no name for it. Then, right? at, yeah, no, there was no. You didn't. They didn't. Never heard of dyslexia in those days. But they just thought I was as thick as anything. So I'd look at a blank sheet of paper, I just couldn't understand the answers at all. And yet now, you know, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, rocket science facts, and, <laughs> and, and, I, and because I'm interested, I can, I can actually um, um, understand it, and, you know, enough to have a, a reasonable conversation. I've heard from a, a little bird that there's a moment in the film, to bring it back full circle now, the film that just, congratulations, by the way, just Thank yesterday, you. I heard the premiere went great, um, that, you were, uh, you were going to abort the mission. Um, something about, you know, you jumped out of a plane in preparation, you had some experience of yeah. pulling your parachute or not pulling your parachute, and that there's some parallels there. Did, was the dyslexia at work in that moment? Was that? Yeah, I mean, I think there, is, there, there are different ways that dyslexia plays on people, and um, on this occasion, um, no spoilers here, we have yeah. to go see the film. Anyway, but on this occasion, I pulled the cord that got rid of the parachute, not the cord that opened the parachute, and anyway, somehow I'm still here today. <laughs> but you'll have to see the film to see how we survived that one, <laughs> but anyway. Incredible. Um, they are not, a, not, a, not, a, not, not a good idea. In but just the few minutes that we've uh, got left, um, is there something that if you revealed it uh, in this interview that people would not likely know about you, what would that thing be? Something that not that you haven't um, talked about rather publicly, but something that would be a surprise to some people to know about you. Uh, let me think. Um, I'm a pretty open book. Um, okay, the one story I didn't tell in my book <laughs> <laughs> was was uh, I was driving when I was, as a 21 year old down to Oxford one day, and um, the police saw I went behind me. I was driving at 100 miles an hour, and um, and I thought. I do not want to be put off the road for six months. Um, so I, I leant over to my friend who was sitting next to me. I punched him in the stomach, took the car window down, and um, he was buckled up in agony. And I said, my friend, he's got an attack of appendicitis. And, um, and, and um, so the policeman uh, looked at him, looked at me, and then said, right, follow us. And sour and blaring, <laughs> off we go to the local hospital. <laughs> and um, when we got to the hospital, um, John, was trying to think how we could get out of this now, and so they're going to start sticking tubes and needles. And so him. he said to the he said to the doctor, "Look, I haven't been to the loo for a week. This could be the problem." So anyway, the next moment I see this doctor with a rubber glove <laughs> <laughs> going, going into the cubicle, and um, he's, some, he's still somehow a friend. But uh, anyway, he, that was called true sacrifice. For, 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 and 
yeah, we, we, yeah. Some, we somehow got off it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you beat my next question. Are you still friends with John? It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like you are. He's forgiven yeah. you. Yeah, he's forgiven me. Brilliant. Well, uh, I'm super grateful for your time. Richard. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Um, and Good luck, everybody out there. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. The best of luck to all of you all out there. And again, tune in tomorrow where you get another one of these videos. Thanks again for tuning in to Creative Live. I'm Jesus Jarvis. So